Well, good morning and welcome to CBC. We are so glad that you are joining us online today. Let's get ready wherever we are. Let's sing some songs together this morning. Sing Don't Lose Heart. Don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. There is peace, there is peace in the storm, in the storm. No, don't forget, he is the Lord, he is the Lord of all. There is a king, there is a king of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. And there is one, only one, where my help comes from. Oh, and there is a king, there is a king of glory. There is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Oh, open the gates of heaven. Shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. You're the King of glory, Lord. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one. Your word will come to 
Thank you that we can be confident knowing that you have never failed us, God. Knowing that no matter what comes before us in life, God, that your promise still stands. You are holding our hand all the way through it, God. You are with us in the good, in the bad, God, in the ugly. Your promise still stands. Your faithfulness still stands, God. We can be confident in that. And Father, we thank you for that today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen, church family. We are so glad that we've been able to continue to meet online, even though we can't meet in person. And we are just so blessed to be able to do so. And the mission and the vision of CBC isn't possible without the generosity of you, the church. So if you would like to partner with us, if you would like to give to CBC, you can go to countrybible.org give and follow the steps there. And if you're new, 
welcome. We are so glad that you are here. We are so glad you are joining us online, and we cannot wait till you can join us in person again. But for now, let's go to our website. You can click the Connect tab, countrybible.org. Click the Connect tab and fill out our Connect card, and someone is going to reach out to you. We're going to send you a gift to, know, to let you know that we are thrilled that you are joining us online today. Now let's get ready. Pastor Andrew is about to give us the message, so let's get ready to hear a word from God today. Hey, have you heard? Have you heard? This is a question that we hear often, starting really from when we were younger, and that's prevalent in our lives today. It's a question that's usually about someone else or something else. And a lot of times it's secondhand or thirdhand or fourthhand. We as individuals almost feel entitled, like we have a right to know about everybody else and everything else that's going on around us. And here's one thing that I know to be true about a lot of cultures in general is that gossip is actually gospel even when it's not. Let me say that again. Gossip becomes gospel even when it's not true. What would happen if we exchanged gossip with the gospel? It would change the world. If instead of saying, hey, have you heard? And we follow that up with someone else or something else. We allowed our lives and our words to address the same question, but with the gospel in mind. Hey, have you heard? Join me today as that's exactly what we're going to be studying together. Grab your Bible. Jump to the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. It's a little more than halfway through your Bible. John chapter 4. We pick up in our brand new series we started last week entitled Signs, where we're going to look at Jesus through the Gospel of John, starting with seven miraculous signs that Jesus gives. While you guys are turning to John chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 43 through 54. Let me start our time together in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity to share in your word. I thank you for this online community. I thank you for Country Bible Church and how you're moving in us and through us. God, I thank you for our amazing tech team who make this, this ability for us to gather online virtually like this possible. And I pray now that you would be glorified together in this teaching. I pray that as we read your word, as we study your word, as we rightly divide your word, that it would come alive in us, move in us, move us to where you want us to go. Help us to step in faith and act out of obedience in your word. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be a gift holy and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, Jesus is in the region of Galilee. He's in a small village town called Cana. He's at a wedding with his mom and his disciples, and this catastrophe happens when they run out of wine. Mary comes to Jesus. She's a, an attendant of the wedding in some form or fashion, and she relies on Jesus to, to, to help with the circumstance. Jesus gives this idiom, which is a statement. It's a, it's a way of saying something culturally to, to address facts. What he says is, from me to you to me, why is it our concern? But then Mary does something really unique. She invites the disciples in to uh, watch what Jesus does and invites the servants in to participate. And what we looked at is how Jesus, in a word, he, he speaks and these people follow and they fill up these jars and the water turns to wine and it's not just any wine, but it's the best wine and he saves the day and it's amazing. But it really sets the tone for an amazing ministry that's going to follow. And, it, and can you imagine the conversations coming out of that? So Jesus then will leave Cana with his mom and his disciples. And they're going to head over to another town called Capernaum. They're going to stay there for a couple of days. And after being there for a little while, they realize that it's close to the Passover, which is one of three major festivals that they will make this pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem to be a part of. Jesus and his disciples will make this journey. They'll make their way from the region of Galilee and they'll go down to Jerusalem. When they get there, crazy things start to take place. Jesus goes to the temple and he sees that they're doing ridiculous things inside the, the church, if you will, of that day. And he begins to toss over tables and he drives them out and has this radical conversation with them. Through this, people are seeing and they're hearing and they're partaking in what Jesus is doing and it's changing all kinds of cultural landscapes all around them. Well, there's one man there who's a Pharisee. He's a religious leader, and his name is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus sees this, and he comes to Jesus, but he comes in the, 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 the cover of night, and he has this cool conversation with Jesus about life. And in this moment, Jesus speaks 
absolute truth to Nicodemus about life. And Nicodemus is so confused by it. And Jesus says, how can you understand the greater things when you don't understand these, these little things? And Nicodemus is confused. He's hung up on the wrong things and hyper-focused on what doesn't matter. And he's missing the mark. And Jesus just lays it out for him. And from there, these conversations start happening and people start all over the place. Hey, have you heard? Have you heard about Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene? Hey, have you heard about what Jesus did in Cana? Yeah, he turned the, the, the water into wine. Did you hear about what Jesus did in the temple? He got outrageously, uh, like, like righteous anger. He flipped over tables and he made a whip and he drove people out of the temple. Have you heard about what Jesus' teachings are? Have you heard that there are people that are leaving their jobs? They're leaving their families and they're following Jesus. Have you heard? Have you heard? There's all this talk, all this noise, all this chatter about Jesus. And for a lot of the wrong reasons, Jesus then will leave Jerusalem and he'll head back toward the region of Galilee. Going on at this time, there's more chatter. Jesus and his disciples are baptizing people. And John the baptizer is baptizing people. And people are going to John and they're saying, hey, have you heard that Jesus is, is baptizing people? And, and how, how can he do that? And John says, look, I must decrease so that he must increase. And I, I'm just a servant. I'm just a, I'm just a, 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 a piece of the puzzle. He is, he is Jesus, the Messiah. This is the gospel. So they're coming to John saying, have you heard? And John said, have you heard? Have you heard about the one promised? Have you heard? As Jesus and his disciples make their way up through Samaria, which is something we're going to address in a few weeks, they head back to the region of Galilee and they end up back in Cana where they had performed this amazing miracle. Jesus had done this wonder, this miraculous event had taken place. As we pick up the story, there's a an amazing thing that's about to take place that I'm excited for us to, to jump into. So what I want to do is I want to read these verses together and we're going to spend just a few minutes unpacking them. And at the end, I hope to give us three things to think about, three things to focus on, three things that we can draw out from our time together in this text. Follow along with me, if you will. John chapter four, verse 43. At the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. Now, the two days, you're probably wondering, what is the two days? I'd encourage you to go back and read the text, but it's a crazy cool conversation that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman at the well, and this woman who is radically changed goes to tell her entire community about Jesus and the things that he's said to her. The entire community comes to see firsthand and to hear firsthand for themselves instead of her saying, hey, have you heard? They wanted to hear. So Jesus spends two days with them, teaching and sharing his life with them. So now this is on the heels of that. And we're going to look at that story in another series that we're going to do coming up entitled Critical Conversations. But here, just for context, go back and read it. It's a cool story. Verse 44, he himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. So this this gives some description to why Jesus is traveling and sharing the gospel, his life, the, the, the message that God has given and why he's here outside of where he's from. You see, sometimes where we're at, where we come up from, it can be a really difficult place to, to change or to, to, to demonstrate change. Because these are people who say, man, I knew him when he was, and I remember him as he was. And as these people are seeing Jesus grow into the reason that God sent him, they're in their minds. They're saying, man, this is, this is Joseph's son. He's a carpenter. He's one of us. And they're not receptive to the message. Not just the people around him, even Jesus' own family aren't receptive to the reason that he's here, the person of God through Jesus. So there's this confusion, there's this frustration that is mounting early on in his ministry. And Jesus addresses, even from the onset, why he's traveling around to speak. Check this out, verse 45. Yet the Galileans, now talking about the region of Galilee, they welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. These Galilean people had made the same pilgrimage that Jesus and his disciples make to the holy city of Jerusalem to honor the Passover, to celebrate this festival, this feast. And while they're there, they see Jesus do these crazy things like tipping over tables in the temple and, and they hear about the conversations he's having and the, the amazing things that are going on. So they're interested. They've seen for themselves, not just what they're hearing from others, but they've seen for themselves and they want to know more. 
as they've encountered Jesus, they lean in all the more. Look at verse 46. As he, Jesus, traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in the nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. Now, in the original language and in the Vulgate, this, this official, this government official, the wording there literally means little king. What we need to learn in this statement is that this is an individual with power and authority who serves King Agrippa at that time. And there's a whole cultural undertone there as well. He didn't, what you're going to see is this man comes to Jesus, but he didn't come because uh, of, of his faith in Jesus or his, his desire to follow Jesus religiously. He had his own background and, and religion in Capernaum. He comes for something really specific. It says that this government official, he's nearby Capernaum, and he was there with, whose son was very sick. Anytime you see in the Bible somebody who was very sick, it should tell us that they were actually almost to the point of death. That this is, this is bleak, the outcome is, is obvious. And so this man is a father to this boy, is desperate for his son's life. And he comes, and in verse 47 it says, When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea, now to Galilee, he went and he begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son, who is about to die. Now, why did I tell you a little bit about the background of this little king, this servant to King Agrippa? Because here we see this man of stature lose his mind over the life of his son. It would have been undignified for a man in his position, with his authority and power, to beg. And yet here we see, John tells this story that this man is so messed up over the fact that his son's life is on the line, that he comes to Jesus and he begs. How did he hear about Jesus? Why did he come to Jesus? Well, I think, I think part of why he, he's coming is because of the possibilities. It's likely that a man in this position, in this power, has the money, the resources, the means, the people around to try a lot of different options to heal his son. And he's running out of options and he's running out of time. So he comes to Jesus with possibility for his son and he comes unapologetically and he comes undignified where he he falls down before Jesus and he begs it's literally the image is like a beggar pleading that if, if someone doesn't provide that there he'll be lost there will be nothing for him can you imagine the onlookers the people who know his position he can be identified likely by his garments he can be identified likely by his traveling companions. He might even be identified by the horse he rode or the donkey he rode in on. Maybe he's identifiable by the, the, the rings that he's wearing. And these people now in this Canaan, uh, this Canaan area in the region of Galilee are watching this man come. And can you imagine the conversations that are beginning to take place about him? Hey, have you heard? Did you hear about the King Agrippa's servant? King Agrippa's man in the court who came and he, he fell down at Jesus' feet and he begged. Why did he do it? Because he was so desperate to save the life of his son. I want to ask you guys to really think about something. What would you do for the one that you love? What lengths would you go? What heights would you go to to see that the person that you love most was healthy and whole. Now that you've had a minute to think about that, ask yourself this way. James describes, Peter describes, that this dwelling, that this body is temporary. The Bible describes that our life is like a vapor, it's a mist, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. We have not just flesh and bones to worry about. We've got eternity on the line. At the end, every single one of us, spanning the globe, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every color, every gender, every age, is going to stand before the throne room of God. And we are going to have to give an account for our relationship or lack thereof with Jesus. And what we did with our faith this side of heaven. Speaking of heaven, heaven is 
for real. Not to sound cliche, but there is a, an eternal dwelling, a new heaven and a new earth where we will go and we will spend the rest of our lives in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we will worship and we will grow all the more in, in who we are in Christ. And, and it's going to be beautiful. And we are going to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There will be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more racial tension or divides, no more brokenness. It's all going to be absolutely decimated. But the, the opposite of that is that there's a very real hell. And that those who have not professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will spend an eternity separated from God in a lake of fire, separated from God in the most unbelievable circumstances beyond anything that we could ever imagine or dream of where it is constant sorrow, it is constant brokenness, it is constant wailing. It is constant pain. The descriptions in the Bible about hell, it's just, it's, it's incomparable to anything else. The difference between heaven and hell is the life that we have in Christ. So let me ask you again. What would you do to save the life of the ones that you love? What would you do to save the lives of those around you? What lengths would you go to? Here's this nobleman. Here's this man of authority and power in the king's court. And he travels 15 miles by foot. It's about a, you can walk uh, probably three, three miles an hour, conservatively, four miles maybe. And you get there and this is a day's journey in the hot sun and and you fall down before the feet of Jesus, completely undignified, begging, crying out to Jesus, willing to, to put your reputation on the line, willing to put your finances on the line, willing to put everything on the line to save the one you love. Have you heard? People begin to say, have you heard what this man did? Have you heard how he fell down and begged? This man in King Agrippa's court is begging. Have you heard? Why was he there? Why was he willing to, to put himself out there like that? Because of the possibilities. Let's keep going. In verse 48, Jesus asked, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? If you look at that again, Jesus seems to be speaking to this, this nobleman who's begging, right? This man falls down before Jesus, begging for his son's life. And Jesus says, Will you not Will you not understand unless I continue to perform these miraculous signs and wonders? But he's not actually talking exclusively to this man. Remember, he's in Cana. This is a small village, and people are coming from all over the place because of what they've heard. And now they've seen, some of them, these Galileans have seen for themselves in Jerusalem what Jesus has done. So Jesus isn't speaking solely to this man. He's not making a point of this man. Instead, He's talking to the collective you. This is a plural word use here where he says, it's a plural usage of the word here when he says, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? Man, he's talking about motivation and that our motivation matters. Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? Or are we going to continue to chase miracles and signs and wonders? Do we care about the do or the who? Do we care about the things that Jesus will do or the who he is? And I think it's not exclusive. I actually think it's inclusive that they run together. They coexist. There's a symbiotic relationship between the two. But here Jesus is saying, look, you guys, you've heard about what I do and you're coming because of what I do. Will you not... Will you not believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? Unfazed by Jesus' challenge to the collective audience, verse 49 tells us what this official does. Verse 49, the official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Here it goes again. He knows that the, the life of his son hangs in the balance and that Jesus has the possibility of life in his hands 
and he's begging, he's crying out, he's pleading, Jesus, would you just come? Would you leave the crowd? Would you come with me? Let me take you to my boy because I believe that you could touch him and he could be healed. I believe you could speak life and he could be healed. I believe that you could just change the, 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 the landscape of his circumstances. Jesus, come, please heal my boy, save my boy because his life matters. In verse 49, we see this man demonstrate tremendous humility and an absolute faith. Look at 50. Then Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. Jesus looks at this man and he says, go back home. Your son will live. He speaks life at the sound of his voice with the very words that roll off of his tongue. He gives life. He speaks life. He brings life. Jesus cares about life. And in that moment, it doesn't say that this official believes in Jesus. It doesn't say that this official gives his life to Jesus. It doesn't say that this official changes everything about the way he lives his life. He came because of the possibilities, but check out what happens next. And the man believed... What Jesus said, not who he was, but what he said, and he started for home. The man believed what Jesus said. Now, he came with possibilities, but he's leaving with a promise. He came because of the possibilities of what Jesus could do, and he's leaving with the promise of what Jesus has done. He knows that he's exhausted all other options, He hears this man, this one that they call the Messiah that he's heard about, speak words of life over his son, and he gets up in absolute faith, and he comes with possibilities, but he leaves with the promise. How many of us are so consumed with our circumstances and our surroundings that we lose sight of the promises of God? Some of you watching right now, you may say, well, what are those promises? How do I know what those promises are? I am so glad you asked because there are 66 books beginning in Genesis, ending in Revelation, and starting in John. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This book right here, the 39 books in the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, the the history and, and, and the Chronicles, and the poetry, and and the laws, and the laments, and the prayers, and the gospels, and the epistles, and and the the, the coming, the the, the end times of what's coming, these all contain the promises of God. So many of you, just like me, we we come to God because of the possibilities. We've tried everything else that the world has to offer, and it hasn't worked, and so we're coming to church Maybe because somebody's invited us and and we just think, man, maybe it's just possible that something will be different. Maybe it's possible that God would hear from me. Maybe it's possible that God would would meet me. Uh, Maybe it's possible that God would receive somebody like me. We come with possibilities and, and he gives us these promises. But how many of us, when we receive a promise from God, we still stay there begging? Friends, I want to tell you that God... God has given you and me so many promises. They're all right here. That's why I encourage you every single week to grab your Bible, to follow along, to circle things, to highlight things. That's why we're doing this series, Signs, and the next series, Critical Conversations, and the series after that, the I Am's of of Jesus, because it reveals all the more the promises of our Savior. And we don't have to keep begging because he's already provided those. We get to hold on to the promises of Jesus. Here, something really cool happens. The man came with the possibilities and he left with the promise. The man believed what Jesus said and he started home. Verse 51. While the man was on his way home, some of his servants met him with the news. There it is again. When you hear somebody talk about the news, you're hearing them talk about what they've heard. Hey, have you heard? Have you heard? They come with the news that his son was alive and well. Now check this out. We learned right here in verse 52 how gravely ill he really was. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, yesterday 
afternoon at the one o'clock, uh, his fever suddenly disappeared. Suddenly disappeared. Isn't that amazing? When we can't explain the sovereign movement of God, we chalk it up to coincidence. We call it happenstance. It suddenly happened. Why don't we call it what it is? The miraculous move of God. That he can do for us what no one and no thing can do. This man hears his servants reporting to him the hour and the time and the circumstances surrounding his boy's healing. And it says here, verse 53, Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. Now, I read through it because I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanted to finish the context, but I want to go back and I want to revisit verse 53 and verse 54. It says, Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him. This is the, this is the purpose for John sharing these miracles to confirm the power and the presence and the person of Jesus to validate his life and his ministry. It's evidence. It's proof. And he realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. So what happens as a byproduct of this? Check this out. He comes with the possibilities. He leaves with the promise. But then right here, and he and his entire household believed in Jesus. When he left Cana, it said he believed what Jesus said. On his way to Capernaum, 15 miles removed from Cana, he encounters these servants. He hears what's happened, and he no longer believes just in the promise, but he believes in the person of Jesus. And not just him, but him and his household. That's the power of the gospel. He goes back and he tells everybody in his sphere of influence, what Jesus has just done, this miracle worker, this Messiah, the promised one here now among us, that he spoke life, that at his words that came from his mouth, his boy received life. The fever broken, he who was on the edge of death was now alive and well. I mean, every one of us has a responsibility with what we say and who we say it to. Every one of us has heard that question asked of us. Hey, have you heard? And every one of us has said, hey, have you heard? And, and I'll be completely honest, we're going to continue to do that. But my question is, if we reframe that from gossip to the gospel, what happens? Proverbs, the, the book of Proverbs tells us over and over and over and over again the dangers of gossip. That gossip is deadly. That it's divisive. That it blows up friendships. That it divides whole communities. The Bible also tells us what the gospel can do. That the gospel, the good news message of Jesus Christ, saves, redeems, restores, regenerates. It makes what is broken and battered into something beautiful, a new beginning. Every one of us has been asked that question hey, have you heard? Every one of us has asked that question. Hey, have you heard? There's a, a time in my life that seems like forever ago. It was 24 years ago. I was 16 years old. That I had a conversation with Pastor Scott Reevely. At the time, it was Westland Baptist Church. And he asked me this question. Have you heard? what Jesus has done for you? I went to Scott and I asked him the same question from the onset. Hey, Scott, have you heard everything that's happened to me? Have you heard where I came from? Have you heard all the horrible things that have happened in my life? Have you heard how people have treated me? Have you heard that I was a high school dropout? Have you heard that, that I was reckless and I was ruthless? Have you heard these things? Have you heard what's gone on in my life? And I asked the question, if you've heard these things, why would a good God allow these things to happen to me? And he asked the same question, have you heard? Have you heard about the saving power 
of Jesus, the redeeming power of Jesus, the life that Jesus laid down so that you could have new life, the same kind of life that this boy had at the, at the word of Jesus, this new life, this regeneration. But if Scott hadn't told me, how would I have I heard? And my question for you, for those of you sitting right now watching this message, ask yourself right now, in the comfort of your confines, if whomever presented the gospel to you hadn't shared with you, hadn't asked you this question, hey, have you heard? Where would you be right now? What would happen if we went away from today? What if we said that today was a day where we are going to go with the message because we always go with the message. We always ask the question, have you heard? Have you heard what's happening in Minneapolis right now? Have you heard about the riots? Have you heard uh, about the racial tensions? Have you heard about the coronavirus? Have you heard about this pandemic? Have you heard about the stimulus checks? Have you heard about the greatest unemployment rate that the country has known in decades? Have you heard about the political uh, powers and the way that they're treating each other? Have you heard the insults that they're throwing at each other? Have you heard what Fox News said? Have you heard what CNN News says? Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard what this church is saying? Have you heard what that church is doing? What if we walked away and instead of asking the question, have you heard, and we followed up with about someone else or about something else, and we went to those who are desperately in need of truth and love and life, and we asked them this question, have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard the gospel? Have you heard the one who gave all for all once and for all? Have you heard that he has the power to restore life and to give life for all eternity? Have you heard that all you need to do, all that is necessary is to receive the grace that God gives? And by the way, his grace is sufficient. Oh, and by the way, his grace doesn't cost you anything, but it will require everything. Have you heard that Jesus came and he lived and he dwelt among us for over 30 years, that Jesus died? A, 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 a sinner's death, but he lived a perfect life. Have you heard that Jesus was buried in a cave, a borrowed tomb? Have you heard that for three days Jesus lay there, but like he promised, because people were talking about what they had heard, Jesus in, in, in John chapter 2 and in John chapter 3, there's all this conversation of confusion where Jesus says at the temple, you tear it down and I'll rebuild it in three days. And they said, it took us over 40 years to build this. You must be crazy. Have you heard how Jesus restored the temple by, by robbing death from the grave? Have you heard about how Jesus came back to life and how Jesus gives life and life abundantly? Have you heard? That's a question that every one of us needs to ask. We have to ask. We would be irresponsible if we didn't ask. But friends, what if we went away from talking about other people and other things and we started using our lives as a living testimony to share the greatest message the world will ever know that the whole world needs to know? Have you heard? Have you heard? Here's what I believe. I believe that everybody is looking for possibilities. How many people do you know right now that are out of work? How many people do you know right now that are devastated over the racial tension that our country is facing? How many people do you know that are absolutely confused about the conflicts going on all around our globe? How many people have you heard that are living in absolute fear over the coronavirus? How many people have you heard that are, that are lost and broken and desperately looking for answers? They're looking for possibilities. And unfortunately, far too many of us look in far too many places for the, for the wrong thing. My hope is that they'll come to church because of you and that they'll encounter Christ because they're looking for possibilities. And as they're sharing with you their plight, as they're sharing with you their brokenness, that you'll be able to say, hey, have you heard? Not what so-and-so did, not what they're doing, but have you heard what Jesus did and how he restores and redeems and regenerates? Have you heard how Jesus changed my life? They're looking for possibilities. When they come looking for these possibilities, it is our privilege to be able to present them with the promise of God, the promises of God. And I would love for you to dive into the Word of God, to begin to learn the promises that are, that are captured in these 66 books, the promises of God that He'll never leave us and that He'll never forsake us, the promises of God that the God of Abraham and Isaac, the God of yesterday, today, and forever, has been and always will be, that He is the Alpha and the Omega, and He does what He did and will do. 
The promise is that he loves you. That God's got plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God's got so many promises for us. People are desperately looking for possibilities. And we have every opportunity to present promises. Part of that is we can share the promises that we've received. The promise of new life. That those who are in Christ are redeemed. They're new. And then, as you share your life, as you and I are faithful to share the gospel, these individuals who are looking for possibilities, who are hanging on to these promises, as we lift up his name, the Bible says, he will draw all people unto himself. And they will encounter the person of Jesus and experience new life. And that, my friends, is a miracle worth talking about. So, have you heard? Have you heard? How many people do you need to find this week to share your life with? How many people do you need to find this week to share this truth with? How many people do you need to find this week to give the gospel to? Just this last week, I received a message from an individual who attends our church. We haven't gathered at this campus now for a couple of months because of all that's going on around us. But this individual came and they asked, can I, can I come by the church and pick up a Bible? I want to give it to a friend of mine. I said, yes, yes, yes. Friends, in the last three years, we've given out over 1,300 Bibles. We've got a stockpile of them here because we want to give God away to everyone. We want everyone to have the Word of God in their hands. Unapologetically, come by the church. We're open Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4. You can make an appointment if you want to meet one of our pastors and come to Terry or Brooke or anybody in the office, Maryland, pick up a Bible, pick up two Bibles. Come and get them. We want you to take them and we want you to share the gospel radically and generously. And as you live the gospel, people are going to ask and there's going to be answers. Hey, have you heard? Have you heard what's happened to so-and-so? Man, their faith in Jesus is incredible. And people are going to come. They're going to come looking for the same possibilities that you came with. Hoping for the same promises that you and I have received. And God willing, as we step out in faith and absolute obedience, we'll leave having encountered the person of Jesus. And their lives will change forever. So there it is. There it is. Three things that I want you to reflect on. Possibilities, promise, and person. Everybody is looking for possibilities. God's word is full of his promises. And we have an obligation and a responsibility to share the gospel so that people people can encounter the person of Jesus. Father, I pray now that you would equip us, that you would empower us, that you would move through us to take the gospel, to share the gospel unapologetically, with absolute confidence. I thank you for this example of this nobleman who comes before Jesus, this man of authority, and with reckless abandon falls down at the feet of Jesus begging for life for the ones that he loves. May we have the same zeal and fervor for the people around us because their lives matter. Their eternal life matters. May we passionately and unapologetically fall down on our faces, begging you for the people around us that don't know you, that they would come to the saving knowledge of you, Jesus Christ, as they encounter you, and that their lives would be changed forever. I pray for my brothers and sisters today that we would not only know the promises of your word, but we would live them out. Help us to walk and steadfastness in these promises. And then finally, as we are faithful to share the person of Jesus, I pray that you would use us as conduit and that we would see the harvest won for you. I pray all this in the authority of the one who can speak life, the only one who speaks life, Jesus. Amen. Have a great week.